can serve. But with this, we're going to move into this morning's sermon. And as we just got done talking about the bread and the cup together, we're going to move to a different part of the story of the service as we continue the story. I'd like us all to stand as I read to you today's scripture found in Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 to 20. Let me see if my remote's going to work. There we go. I put it on the screen for you if you can read it. It says this, Matthew 28, 16 to 20. It should be familiar words to you as it's the great commission that we're all commissioned to do. Now, the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Thank you. You may be seated. So we're transitioning now to a different part of the service, but it's such a natural part because it's such a natural transition. I loved writing up the sermon today as I was thinking about how it all fit together. But we, because we just got done taking, taking part together in the cup and in the bread, talking about Jesus' last days, his last instructions for his disciples. And then we move naturally on, if you were to look in your Bible, to Jesus' death upon the cross. His blood spilt, life sacrificed, everything we're talking about was communion. The burial, the resurrection, and then guess what? As Jesus comes back, he gives us these words, the great commission. So again, it's a natural transition. And it's a great time, because I've always thought about having just a sermon on the great, or not the great commission, but just on communion. Because every week it just seems like it's such a powerful experience we do together. We could end now. And we could go home with those strong, this strong representation of Jesus' life, forgiveness in our minds. But here we get to naturally transition a different way. The Great Commission, a life of adventure. What a great day to be talking about a, a life of adventure, too. Because this week, the kids go back to school. Many of our adult lives also go back to a different routine, a bit of an adventure as we're tossing everything around, trying to do this balancing act of sports and of life, of school, of work, of hobbies, <laughs> if you can find the time. Um, I believe bear hunting, deer hunting season starts here this week and the week to follow for archery for deer. So we have so many things we're trying to balance, and it's a life of adventure. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't just end with church in the summer. The same, same thing's about to happen here at Bloomer Baptist Church. We're going to be kicking back off Sunday schools, coached by Christ. We're going to be kicking off youth group and Alpha and a free Wednesday night meal to kick it all off. And as thank you, Lee, for the announcement, we're also talking about a, a free, I, I keep calling it a free fun festival, but a free community picnic on September 30th. And I thank you for Lee and Mona for their passion to take this forward and make it into so much more than I could ever dream of. Um, it's a life of adventure. It's an adventure because there's so much to life. We can't just stay in our houses and ignore life. We must pursue life. An adventure may be scary or exciting. It may be positive or negative. But either way, an adventure is life-changing. And that's what we're talking about today. I was having a great discussion this week with someone who stopped by my office one of our great people of Bloomer Baptist Church, and it just sparked a thought for this sermon. I want to share it with you today. I'm going to try and keep the names private. I feel like a detective show. I remember my dad used to watch this show. Oh, what was it, Adam 12, maybe? It was a detective show when I was a kid, and it would always say, the names will be protected of the innocent to, well, protect them, I guess. So, <laughs> well, I'm going to try and protect the names from this story, but... I'm sure being the church we are in a very close-knit family, you'll probably know exactly who I'm talking about. But it's a story of adventure. Life is full of adventure, and some of us love a good adventure. I know I do. My wife and our kids just recently got back from Duluth. We took a one-day adventure, went up to see Duluth, 
saw a bunch of waterfalls along the way, went up to the North Shore, Inger Tower, and we got back just one night away. There was one time that we went all the way to Disney World in Florida, drove there just in a weekend, and got back. We love adventure. It keeps you alive. But here's the thing. You have a choice with adventure. We can either seek it out and enjoy the ride, or we can avoid it. Some things you should avoid. I'm not going to point any fingers at people. I won't think anything less of you if you don't like adventure, if you don't seek it out. But this week, I got a great story, and here it is. <clears throat> I had one of, my, one of our many great people stop by the office, as I, as I said, and she started talking to me about what's going on in the next week of her life. You see, what she was talking to me about is her son is about to move across country. Now, already, some of you might know who I'm talking about. But her son is about to move across country as he, he explores a new part of his life to go to college. I believe it's in Seattle, Washington. And some people had told her, aren't you sad? Aren't you disappointed? Aren't you frustrated? I mean, aren't you going to miss your son? And, and you, you must be just so upset. We'll be praying for you. And there's nothing wrong with this because a time like this can be very trying in a person's life. None of us like change. But here's what her response was. Her response was, you know what? I'm not sad at all. I'm excited for him because he's going on an adventure. She was excited for him because he's going on an adventure. And in fact, she continued to talk about how her husband and her are actually leaving today. So I doubt they're at church today because they're packing up the motor home. And they're leaving themselves today to kind of follow him along on the adventure. Actually, they're leaving before him. And he's going to meet them out there so that they can help him unpack his things. And again, we're excited. We can't wait to leave. We can't wait for this new adventure, this new part of his life to begin. So that's the thought that I've been just focusing on all week. As I thought about the Great Commission. I thought about how the Great Commission is a life of adventure. And are we excited for it? Like this lady was excited for this adventure in her life. Here's the thing. We all have different adventures in our life going on every single day. You can't deny it because our lives are changing every day. But this is one adventure that we're all called to. It's the Great Commission, which is a life of adventure. Why don't we get excited about it? I want you to look at this picture here. Because again, just how God led this, this message this week. I got this in the mail this week. I think this kind of comes down to why we don't get too excited about the Great Commission. A lot of times we have a wrong picture in our head of what the Great Commission is. I hear the laughs. I love it. I'm going to explain this picture a little bit. You see, in this picture we see Jesus off on the right talking to his disciples. And it says, Jesus didn't make disciples this way. Why do we? And it shows his disciples behind desks in a field. Some of these disciples are making paper airplanes. Some of them are talking, maybe sharing answers to the test, <laughs> study notes. This guy's just kind of daydreaming. Maybe each one of you can think, if this was me, which one would you be? In the back, and I had to get clarification from Jessica, our office manager here, I saw these two guys were like looking at a cigar. And it's the one sniffing it and saying, mm, this cigar is going to be good. I don't know. I've seen that in movies. I've never smoked a cigar like that, but Jessica said, no, don't you remember in school, in class, when you used to try and hold your pencil up above your lip? <laughs> They're playing with their pencils. They're not paying attention as Jesus is teaching them, giving them great life lessons and great biblical lessons to help them on the spiritual journey. And there's nothing wrong with that per se, but here's the thing. Again, the Great Commission is not just about this. It's not about a classroom. It's not about telling somebody to go to church. It's not just about talking to your kids, your family. It's your neighbors. It's your city. It's the world. And all of this goes together with it. It's part of it. But it's more than this. It's more than this. So again, look at this picture. Really, let it sink in. I'll tell you, this picture came from an advertisement to me from group publishing called Friends of God, a discipleship experience. And it's a teen study on discipleship. 
But I like those final words as it says, an experience. What type of experience do these guys look like they're having in this picture? Now, it's not Jesus' fault. It's the disciples' fault. Jesus is giving them all they need for life. But as we see Jesus teaching them, the disciples aren't listening. One is making a paper airplane. One sleeping, a few playing with their pencils. Again, don't get me wrong, coming to church and classes, all this is great stuff. It's just not where it needs to begin. For some people, it begins here. But others, it should start here. This is everyday discipleship. This is the great commission in each one of your lives. Because the previous picture, sometimes it lacks passion. It lacks motivation. It doesn't show that you care for people when maybe you're at work and you just say, Hey, you should come, come to church today, uh, Sunday. It means a lot to me. Tell them, why does it mean a lot to you? God didn't just call the pastor to tell people about God, or the missionaries to call people to God, uh, tell people about God, or the deacons. God calls all of us to this great commission. It's all of us to go to all of creation, all the nations. Making disciples, the great commission, is a calling to a life of an adventure. And it's an experience. And an experience is part of life. So, everyday discipleship may look like this first picture. You're at work. You're having conversation with people, drinking coffee. Looks like goofing off while you should be working, right? Well, <laughs> maybe you're on break. Uh, maybe it's this. Having coffee at a coffee house or grabbing a pizza with some friends. Going out on a fish fry on Friday night. Or maybe it's this. Playing basketball with a friend doing other sports, kids, going to school, going for a hike with your friends or your family. I mean, there's many examples we can say, but all of this, the Great Commission can happen during, as an experience, as you're out doing life with people. You see, that's what Jesus did. Jesus lived life with people. He taught in parables in a way which the people would understand. And he did it personally with them. And that's what, what we're commanded to do too, is a commission. We're all commanded to go to all nations. Not just in the church, but in your life. God already gives you so many ways to make disciples. How are we doing it? All of these activities are ones which you can do the great commission in everyday life. Go to all nations making disciples. <clears throat> but here's the next key phrase. Wherever you are. Whatever you're doing, using all God gives you, every experience God puts you in, you can be making disciples to teach them God's ways, to tell them about the gospel, about Jesus, about his cross. Jesus lived life with people. He told parables and he used daily discussions to shape and form a discussion with disciples to tell them about Jesus. How are we doing this every day? Are we? How many people could you be discipling right now if you look to the relationships that God's already given you? The people that he puts in your life each and every single day. Instead of thinking to ourselves, well, God, I'm ready, or I'll, I'll do your will if I see an opportunity. But instead of saying if, what if we say make? How are we making an opportunity to tell people about Jesus, to make disciples? to spread this to all nations, to teach them all we know. What are you doing now to make a disciple? What have you done this past week? What are you planning to do in the next week? I think we'd probably be truthful. Maybe some of you are this planned out, but most of us could say nothing. And we should be convicted, myself included. What are we doing right now to make a disciple? What have you done this past week? What are you planning for the next week? Because we need to be more purposed in the Great Commission. Because we are all commissioned to do this. What is keeping us in our lives from being committed to do what the disciples did? I think part of it is because the Great Commission is a life of adventure, but it's also a messy life. The Great Commission is a life of adventure, and it is messy. 
But we're going to see some other things. But let's focus on that messy first. You see, as we look to the Bible and we look to our own lives, to times that we've stood up for something, we know that people don't always agree with us. And sometimes that leads to a mess. Maybe it leads to problems at work. Maybe it leads to us losing our place of employment. Maybe it leads to um, awkward conversations at a family get-together. Maybe it leads to a problem at, at um, just out in the community at a mill. Maybe we look to the Bible's examples, and we see physical, emotional distress. We see martyrdom or sacrifice of their very lives, persecution beyond name-calling, physical abuse. And then we look to our own lives again, and we say, do we want that? Let's look just a moment, though, to this word. We are all commissioned to this mission. And it's a good thing. We're not alone, and we will be blessed. But that word, commissioned, what does that word really mean? Because we're all commissioned, and it's a good thing. We'll never be alone, and we'll be blessed. A salesman earns a commission check. A soldier, especially in older times, would often be known as being commissioned or ordered or commanded to war. All of us are commissioned. This command is for all men, all women, and all children. It's not optional. And if you're already a disciple, then you should be looking to how can I make a disciple? How can I tell, Jesus, tell somebody about Jesus this week? How can I teach somebody something and just really be purposed in my conversations? Commissioning, being commissioned, I really think used to be considered a good thing. I think some of us look at this commissioning and we think it's a bad thing. We think, oh, this is going to be messy. I don't want that. Oh, I'm going to get made fun of. I'm going to get persecuted. I'm going to get all these things. But I think a soldier used to be excited to be commissioned, especially if they're commissioned to a mission which involves giving them a higher rank. Or maybe it's because of the honor that they had then to serve their country. We've lost part of that. We fail, forget the, we fail to remember and we often forget that the commissioning we have involves honor. It involves a reward. It's a good thing. We're, we're reminded that we're not alone and we're going to be blessed. Obviously, being commissioned to war as a soldier was bad. You could lose your life, but it was also an honor. Us being commissioned can be a bad thing if we think about it in a worldly way of the friends we could lose, the, the bad that could happen to us at our workplace or at our school. But ultimately, we'll be blessed. And it's a good thing. It's an honor. Let's go to this next slide here. You see, we're going to receive our own reward. And here's what it is. We're told right there in the Great Commission. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We're not alone. That is a blessing. But beyond that, it's not just about the today, knowing that we're not alone. It's about the future, knowing that we will never be alone, and we even get to be part of this eternal kingdom because of being one with God. But the Great Commission is a mission, and we must all do our part. But here's the often asked question of why. We all like to ask why. Why do I need to be part of this? I don't want to be part of this. This is hard work. Because Matthew 9, 37 tells us, and this is just one verse. I mean, you can look all throughout Scripture and see the why, but I'm focusing here. Because the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Because the opposite of a blessed life with God for all eternity is a tortured life for all eternity in hell. We can look at this verse, Matthew 9, 37, a couple ways. We can say, the harvest is plentiful and people are ready to come to God. But we can also think about the other way. We have this whole harvest which is ready to be processed. And God wants to use us. But if these people don't hear the gospel, then they're going to be the opposite side. They're going to be going to hell, not heaven, because we need life. We need Jesus. We need that forgiveness. But here's the other problem with that. We need to speak truth. Because there's a lot of people right now in the world that are thinking hell's not real. 
they have a wrong belief with hell, and we often have three beliefs. Either some believe hell to be for eternity, but they, they get that whole word eternity mixed up, and they think, well, yeah, I believe in hell, and I believe it's for eternity, but it's, it's just the eternity of your physical body. Once your body burns up and dies, you're done. They think, well, maybe hell's not even real at all, and hell is just talking about this life. This life can seem like hell sometimes, they say, until my body perishes. Some people don't believe in hell at all, and they just believe that hell is a fictitious poetry, fable, something fake in the Bible, fake from all past history that parents would use to scare their kids. But here's some truths from Scripture that tells us about hell. It says, the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. It says, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. It says, and if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day or night. And it says, and throw them into the fiery furnace, and that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But here's the other side of things, guys. Heaven. Heaven is described as God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. A place where we will be in the presence of God forever. Streets of gold, pearly gates. Doesn't this sound like something that you'd want to share with people? Something that you'd want to tell people. But how? How do we tell people about heaven? About hell? Because again, we can't forget that the harvest is plentiful. But we need to remember the why. Why do we need to tell people about this truth? Because we need to remember the life that we have. And we need to be so excited about that life that we have, that forgiveness that we have, that we want to give it to other people. We want to tell other people about it. We're commissioned to do this, and it's a great thing what we're commissioned to do. We're not focusing on the how today as far as giving you step by step, giving you resources in your hands. I've done this many times with the Romans Road, the little life books, the Revive Bibles. There's many ways to share our faith, the ABCs of sharing our faith. But the, it starts with this. It starts with just looking to the Great Commission and thinking, what do you need to do? You need to talk to people. It's a life of, an, of adventure as we just have an experience with life, an experience with people. Let me read this once again, and we're just going to look to it a little bit more. <clears throat> Matthew 28, 16 to 20. And I, as I read this, I just want you to really think about your life. Now, the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus says three things here. This comes from a commentary from William Barclay. It says this, Jesus says three things here. One, he assured them of his power. Surely nothing was outside the power of him who had died and conquered death. The one who is the son of God and has all the power and authority as such. Now they were servants of a master whose power and authority upon earth and in heaven was beyond our comprehension. Number two, Jesus gave them a commission. Jesus gave them a mission. Now, there's no coincidence that he tells them of his power first. It's kind of like that saying, everybody, when you're told something, you want to say, why? You want to ask that person why? Well, he's preventing them from asking them why. He's saying, I have all that. He says, and Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, some translations say therefore, and I love that, that translation which says that. Therefore, because of this, because I have all this authority, because who I am and what I'm telling you to do, go. 
Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. He sent them out to make all the world his disciples. And we're commanded to do this, not just one, but all of us. Based off his authority, based off his power. And then number three, he gave them a promise of his presence. It must have been a staggering. Can you imagine the, the feeling that these 11 humble disciples must have had as Jesus? Well, first of all, they're just amazed that Jesus did even back. But then Jesus giving them such a great, strong commissioning. Hey, it's not just, hey, you see that person over there on the mountain? I don't think they're really following me. Can you go talk to them? I mean, we're, we're talking literally about your life, practical application. I'm telling you to go to your coworker, go to your friend, go to your neighbor. Jesus told these people to go to all nations. Jesus started a movement, a revival, which made his disciples go to all nations and spread the gospel. Can you imagine how staggering that must have been? How scary that must have been? But Jesus continues on with promising them his presence, that he would be with them, not just today, but forever and ever, to the end of the age. They may have had doubts, it said. What it just says, some of them had doubts. Now, why I believe is because he wasn't just telling these 11 disciples to come. He had many followers coming. As he told the 11 disciples to go to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them, there would be many other people there as well. There would still be crowds that would show up. This is a very populated area. Some doubted. But his 11 disciples followed him. They did what they were commissioned to do. And we must as well. We may have doubts human nature, part of our sinful nature, especially when we have Satan behind us all the time trying to pull us away from God. But just like the disciples, we can grasp on to that final statement. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. God puts you right where you are for a purpose, for a reason. He wants you to reach out to somebody. Or maybe he puts you where you're at right now because he wants somebody else to reach out to you. How are we going to allow this to happen? We have the same commission, the same great commission today as the disciples. A life of adventure awaits us. And we are promised of the same. Jesus will be with us always. So what are we going to do? What are you going to do this day, this week? The great commission for Jesus. Here's what I want to tell you to do. I want you to make a plan. I want you to be purposed. I want you to make a game plan and stick to it. There's another adventure. Football season's about to start up in full swing, I should say. It's been preseason games. These football players don't go off on that field without a plan, and we shouldn't go off in life without a plan. We need to look to God, pray to God, as we talked about with prayer last night, and pray that his kingdom will be here on heaven, that his will will be done. And we pray, God... Help me to make a way this week to talk to somebody, to make a disciple. And sometimes it's not about just telling them about Jesus just straight up and saying, hey, you're going to hell unless you accept Jesus, do it now. Sometimes it's about just starting with those small conversations as we talked about in the beginning. Coffee time, around a table for a meal, basketball at school, hiking, fishing, hunting, sewing. Many hobbies, whatever it is, just even around the dinner table. What can you do this week for his kingdom in the harvest, which is plentiful? But let us not forget that the Great Commission does not end with make, making disciples. It's a continual thing throughout your entire life. As you make disciples, you continue to teach them. You continue to live life with them. You continue to encourage them. You continue to love one another. And you continue to help show them how they can then forgive those in their life and show them what Jesus did for them and how to do it for another. So as we end this morning, I just want you to think about that. There are things that you do every single day in your life, not just at church. What can you do tomorrow to start making a disciple? Write it down on a piece of paper. Stick it on your fridge. Stick it on your mirror. 
We should be purposed. Don't just pray, well, if an opportunity presents it myself, I won't be scared. Let's say, let's make a way. Let's make an opportunity to make a disciple this week. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for never giving up on us. You are always there for us, always there for giving us, and always there to equip us. Your word tells us that you'll be with us to the end of the ages. And even beyond that, we have this life which is eternal because of your blood spilt upon the cross that day. Your body broken, just as we spoke today with communion. We thank you for this. Lord, we look to the future and we think, how can we make a disciple this week? How can we do the Great Commission to make disciples of all nations and to baptize them? Lord, we, we can't forget that we should, we must be baptized. It's a part of that commission, part of that command. Lord, we do this, and we do it because of what you told us to do, and you know what's best for our life. But then we continue on to teach people all of your ways, and all the ways that you bless us. Lord, may we be purposed this week to live for you.